Today we're going to dabble in astrophysics. Starting in three, two, one. Okay, here's the deal. Let's learn! In the year 20XX, a pandemic spread across the land. But when educational doors closed and communities practiced social distancing, CFI 70s language and literature teaching was still up for the challenge. Join Mr. Strother and his amazing quarantine! Read aloud. News articles. I'm into it. Comic books. Cool. Writing activities. <laughs> Greyhounds. <laughs> Kids who don't even go here. Wait, Flavored water. Dad jokes. You are now joining Mr. Strother's quarantine. Welcome back, ballers and scholars. It's a brand new week, so it's a brand new theme, baby. Space. 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 No, we're not talking about social distancing. We're talking about beyond our atmosphere, big baller. The cosmos. The, cosmos. the outer, outer wild. wild. The Milky, the Milky way. way. To infinity, to infinity and, beyond. and beyond. Wait, that's Toy Story. And since it's week six, day one, that means read aloud. We're gonna focus on state standard RN 2.3, analyze how a text makes connections and distinctions among individuals, events, and ideas. Now it's probably hard to tell, but I'm actually a huge nerd. Okay, maybe it's not that hard to tell, but I'm more than a literary nerd. I'm a book nerd, yeah, but also a video game nerd, comic book nerd, and science nerd. I don't have a degree in this stuff, but I love geeking out about things I don't understand. And we're just made of stardust, so what greater way to wonder than to look up at the night sky and realize how incredibly small we really are in the grand scheme of things. Okay, it's not nighttime, but you get the point. Side note, students aged 6 to 12 are actually recommended to sleep 9 to 12 hours, and students 13 to 18 are recommended to sleep 8 to 10 hours. So if you notice your family's looking at you sideways, and it's not your middle school bunkiness, Get some rest. Anyway, back to space. Did you know that if you look at the sun, don't stare too long, you'll need glasses thicker than mine, that it took 11 minutes for that light, the image of the sun that you're seeing now to travel to your eyes? Now consider how many light years some other stars take to share their light. Technically, there are stars that have already expanded, exploded, and gone cold. But because they're so far away, what we see is actually their past. Like, <laughs> And excuse me if I nerd out for a second, but did you know that Superman traveled here through either a wormhole or faster than the speed of light to arrive from planet Krypton to planet Earth as a baby? That means knowing that Krypton is hundreds of millions of miles away, that if Superman himself were to look into a telescope at his own home planet, he could see his great, 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 great grandfather in the telescope. His own home planet that's already exploded because that's how long light takes to travel in space. I mean, just think about how quickly light travels when you point a flashlight at something. We can't even perceive how fast it is with our human eyes. And some of those stars are sharing their light with us for hundreds of millions of light years? I mean, what? That's crazy. But let's bring it back down to Earth. Aside from textbooks and the excellent resources found in science and math classes, where can you really sink your teeth into the study of the cosmos? One great book that I discovered this last year is the main man himself, Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's called Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Our goal in this brief exploration is to consider state standard RN 2.3, analyze how a text makes connections and distinctions among individuals, events, and ideas. So what connections does Neil deGrasse Tyson make between not only the cosmos, but having a cosmic perspective? Hmm. Now I've attached a copy of the entire book in PDF format the audiobook as well on our Clever page. However, unlike our usual first chapter read, I'm gonna read something from the end. It's part of an article that Tyson published for Natural History Magazine in April 2007, and it's been reprinted as this text's final chapter. So if you'd like to follow along, you can click on the chapter link to go to the end of the book and read aloud with me. So without further ado, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Long before anyone knew that the universe had a beginning, before we knew that the nearest large galaxy lies two million light years from Earth, before we knew how stars work or whether atoms existed, James Ferguson's enthusiastic introduction to his favorite science rang true. Yet his words apart from the 18th century flourish could have been written yesterday. Who gets to think that way? Who gets to celebrate this cosmic view of life? Not the migrant farm worker, not the sweatshop worker, certainly not the homeless person rummaging through the trash for food. 
You need the luxury of time not spent on mere survival. You need to live in a nation whose government values the search to understand humanity's place in the universe. You need a society in which intellectual pursuit can take you to the frontiers of discovery in which news of your discoveries can be routinely disseminated. By those measures, most citizens of industrialized nations do quite well. Yet the cosmic view comes with a hidden cost. When I travel thousands of miles to spend a few moments in the fast-moving shadow of the moon during a total solar eclipse, sometimes I lose sight of Earth. When I pause and reflect on our expanding universe, with its galaxies hurtling away from one another embedded within the ever-stretching four-dimensional fabric of space and time, sometimes I forget that uncounted people walk this Earth without food or shelter, and that children are disproportionately represented among them. When I pore over the data that establish the mysterious presence of dark matter and dark energy throughout the universe, sometimes I forget that every day, every 24-hour rotation of Earth, people kill and get killed in the name of someone else's conception of God, and that some people who do not kill in the name of God kill in the name of needs and wants of political dogma. When I track the orbits of asteroids, comets, and planets, each one a pirouetting dancer in a cosmic ballet choreographed by the forces of gravity, sometimes I forget that too many people act in wanton disregard for the delicate interplay of Earth's atmosphere, oceans, and land, with consequences that our children and our children's children will witness and pay for with their health and well-being. And sometimes I forget that powerful people rarely do all they can to help those who cannot help themselves. I occasionally forget those things because however big the world is, in our hearts, our minds, and our outsized digital maps, the universe is even bigger. A depressing thought to some, but a liberating thought to me. Consider an adult who tends to the traumas of child, spilled milk, a broken toy, a scraped knee. As adults, we know that kids have no clue of what constitutes a genuine problem because inexperience greatly limits their childhood perspective. Children do not yet know that the world doesn't revolve around them. As grown-ups, dare we admit to ourselves that we too have a collective immaturity of view. Dare we admit that our thoughts and behaviors spring from a belief that the world revolves around us? Apparently not, yet evidence bounds. Part the curtains of society's racial, ethnic, religious, national, and cultural conflicts, and you find the human ego turning the knobs and pulling the levers. Now imagine a world in which everyone, but especially people with power and influence, holds an expanded view of our place in the cosmos. With that perspective, our problems would shrink or never arise at all, and we could celebrate our earthly differences while shunning the behavior of our predecessors who slaughtered one another because of them. Back in January 2000, the newly rebuilt Hayden Planetarium in New York City featured a space show titled Passport to the Universe, which took visitors on a virtual zoom from planetarium out of the edge of the cosmos and route the audience viewed Earth, then the solar system, then watched the hundred billion stars of the Milky Way galaxy shrink in turn to barely visible dots on the planetarium's dome. Within a month of opening day, I received a letter from an Ivy League professor of psychology whose expertise was in things that make people feel insignificant. I never knew one could specialize in such a field. He wanted to administer a before and after questionnaire to visitors assessing the depth of their depression after viewing the show. Passport to the universe, he wrote, elicited the most dramatic feelings of smallness and insignificance he had ever experienced. How could that be? Every time I see the space show and others we've produced, I feel alive and spirited and connected. I also feel large knowing that the goings on within the three pound human brain are what enabled us to figure out our place in the universe. Allow me to suggest that it's the professor, not I, who's misread nature. His ego was unjustifiably big to begin with, inflated by delusions of significance and fed by cultural assumptions that human beings are more important than everything else in the universe. In all fairness to the fellow, poor, powerful forces in society leave most of us susceptible. As was I until the day I learned in biology class that more bacteria live and work in one centimeter of my colon than the number of people who have ever existed in the world. That kind of information makes you think twice about who or what is actually in charge. 
From that day on, I began to think of people not as the masters of space and time, but as participants in a great cosmic chain of being with a direct genetic link across species both living and extinct, extending back nearly four billion years to the earliest single-celled organisms on Earth. I know what you're thinking. We're smarter than bacteria. No doubt about it. We're smarter than every living creature that ever ran, crawled, or slithered on Earth. But how smart is that? We cook our food. We compose poetry and music. We do art and science. We're good at math. Even if you're bad at math, you're probably much better at it than the smartest chimpanzee whose genetic identity varies in only trifling ways from our own. Try as they might, primatologists will never get a chimpanzee to do long division or trigonometry. If small genetic differences between us and our fellow apes account for what appears to be a vast difference in intelligence, then maybe that difference in intelligence is not so vast after all. Imagine a life whose brain power is to ours as ours is to a chimpanzee's. To such a species, our highest mental achievements would be trivial. Their toddlers, instead of learning their ABCs on Sesame Street, would learn, you know, multivariable calculus on Bullion Boulevard. One, our most complex theorems, our deepest philosophies, the cherished works of our most creative artists would be projects their school kids would bring home for mom and dad to display on the refrigerator door with a magnet. These creatures would study Stephen Hawking, who occupies the same endowed professorship once held by Isaac Newton at the University of Cambridge, because he's slightly more clever than all other humans. Why? He could do theoretical astrophysics and other rudimentary calculations in his head like their little Timmy who just came home from alien preschool. If a huge genetic gap separated us from our closest relative in the animal kingdom, we could justifiably celebrate our brilliance. We might be entitled to walk around thinking we're distant and distinct from our fellow creatures, but no such gap exists. Instead, we are one with the rest of nature, fitting neither above nor below, but within. Need more ego softeners? Simple comparisons of quantity, size, and scale do the job well. Take water. It's common and vital. There are more molecules of whiter water in an eight ounce cup of this stuff than there are cups of water in the world's oceans. Every cup that passes through a single person and eventually rejoins the world's water supply holds enough molecules to mix 1,500 of them into every other cup of water in the world. No way around it. Some of the water you just drank passed through the kidneys of Socrates, Genghis Khan, and Joan of Arc. How about air? Also vital. A single breathful draws in more air molecules than there are breathfuls of air in Earth's entire atmosphere. That means some of the air you just breathed passed through, passed through the lungs of Napoleon, Beethoven, Lincoln, and Billy the Kid. Time to get cosmic. There are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on any beach. More stars than seconds have passed since Earth formed. More stars than words and sounds ever uttered by all of the humans who ever lived. Want a sweeping view of the past? Our unfolding cosmic perspective takes you there. Light takes time to reach Earth's observatories from the depths of space. And so you see objects and phenomena not as they are, but as they once were, back almost to the beginning of time itself. Within that horizon of reckoning, cosmic evolution unfolds continuously in full view. Want to know what we're made of? Again, the cosmic perspective offers a bigger answer than you might expect. The chemical elements of the universe are forged in the fires of high mass stars that end their lives in titanic explosions, enriching their host galaxies with the chemical arsenal of life as we know it. The result? The four most common chemically active elements in the universe, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, are the four most common elements of life on Earth, with carbon serving as the foundation of biochemistry. We do not simply live in this universe. The universe lives within us. That being said, we may not even be of this earth. Several sp separate lines of research, when considered together, have forced investigators to reassess who we think we are and where we think we're from. As we've already seen, when a large asteroid strikes a planet, the surrounding areas can recoil from the impact energy, catapulting rocks into space. From there, they can travel to and land on other planetary surfaces. Second, microorganisms can be hardy. 
Extremophiles on Earth can survive wide ranges of temperature, pressure, and radiation encountered during space travel. If the rocky ejecta from an impact hails from a planet with life, then microscopic fauna could have stowed away in the rock's nooks and crannies. Third, recent evidence suggests that shortly after the formation of our solar system, Mars was wet and perhaps fertile even before Earth was. Collectively, these findings tell us it's conceivable that life began on Mars and later seeded life on Earth, a process known as panspermia. So all Earthlings might, just might, be descendants of Martians. Again and again across the centuries, cosmic discoveries have demoted our self-image. Earth was once assumed to be astronomically unique until astronomers learned that Earth is just another planet orbiting the sun. Then we presumed the sun was unique until we learned that countless stars of the night sky are suns themselves. Then we presumed our galaxy, the Milky Way, was the entire known universe until we established that the countless fuzzy things in the sky are other galaxies dotting the landscape of our known universe. Today, how easy it is to presume that one universe is all there is, yet emerging theories of modern cosmology as well as the continually reaffirmed improbability that anything is unique require that we remain open to the latest assault on our plea for distinctiveness, the multiverse. The cosmic perspective flows from fundamental knowledge, but it's more than what you know. It's also about having the wisdom and insight to apply that knowledge to assessing our place in the universe, and its attributes are clear. The cosmic perspective comes from the frontiers of science, yet it is not solely the provenance of the chemist, excuse me, the provenance of the scientist, it belongs to everyone. The cosmic perspective is humble. The cosmic perspective is spiritual, even redemptive, but not religious. The cosmic perspective enables us to grasp in the same thought, the large and the small. The cosmic perspective opens our minds to extraordinary ideas, but does not leave them so open that our brains spill out, making us susceptible to believing anything we're told. The cosmic perspective opens our eyes to the universe, not as a benevolent cradle designed to nurture life, but as a cold, lonely, hazardous place, forcing us to reassess the value of all humans to one another. The cosmic perspective shows Earth to be a moat, but it's a precious moat, and for the moment, it's the only home we have. The cosmic perspective finds beauty in the images of planets, moons, stars, and nebulae, but also celebrates the laws of physics that shape them. The cosmic perspective enables us to see beyond our circumstances, allowing us to transcend the primal search for food, shelter, and a mate. The cosmic perspective reminds us that in space, where there is no air, a flag will not wave an indication that perhaps flag waving and space exploration do not mix. The cosmic perspective not only embraces our genetic kinship with all life on Earth, but also values our chemical kinship with any yet to be discovered life in the universe, as well as our atomic kinship with the universe itself. At least once a week, if not once a day, we might each ponder what cosmic truths lie undiscovered before us, perhaps awaiting the arrival of a clever thinker an ingenious experiment, or an innovative space mission to reveal them. We might further ponder how those discoveries may one day transform life on Earth. Absent such curiosity, we are no different from the provincial farmer who expresses no need to venture beyond the county line because his 40 acres meet all his needs. Yet, if all of our predecessors had felt that way, the farmer would instead be a cave dweller, chasing down his dinner with a stick and a rock. During our brief stay on planet Earth, we owe ourselves and our descendants the opportunity to explore, in part because it's fun to do. But there's a far nobler reason. The day our knowledge of the cosmos ceases to expand, we risk regressing to the childish view that the universe figuratively and literally revolves around us. In that bleak world, arms-bearing, resource-hungry people and nations would be prone to act on their low, contracted prejudices, and that would be the last gasp of human enlightenment until the rise of a visionary new culture that could once again embrace, rather than fear, the cosmic perspective. Wow. If you enjoy his writing, I promise the rest of this book is much the same, if not better. It's conveniently laid out with clickable chapter titles so you can skip to the parts that interest you. Whether it's what's between galaxies or dark matter or invisible light. And since you stuck around to the end, I'll mention one other cool resource as well. Cosmic Queries. 
This is part of Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast that he hosts with different comedians. Occasionally a childhood favorite of mine, Bill Nye the Science Guy, pops in, and I linked an episode on our Clever page as well. Cosmic queries are great because they get right to it. They answer questions that people like you ask. I linked the episode involving space and time, but feel free to explore more on your own. I hope you enjoyed this brief journey. Please remember to hang on to your cosmic perspective. As always, have a great day. 